last time I had a chance to talk to a group of all women was when I was teaching Transcendental Meditation in 1970 to a group of nuns. <laughs> we are all, roughly speaking, comprised of the intersection of three vectors, our circumstance, where we're born, when we're born, our gender, a public narrative, that is, what do we learn and take from the society around us? Everything from our ethics to our understanding of gender to how close do I stand to somebody else when I talk to them? And finally, a personal narrative. This is generally some subset of the public narrative and a little bit of our own specialty. We're in a very interesting time, it seems to me. Um, we came here today to this fascinating conference. Uh, we walked in on a beautiful California day. That's my little title. Um, we walked here on a beautiful California day. We walked in to this place in the most successful and technologically sophisticated country in the world, in the state that is the leader of that world, in the region that's the leader of that world, to a company that arguably is the leader of all of that, a company whose products really have the potential, I think, and maybe already have, done more for the world than Gutenberg's printing press did. And then there are other narratives. <laughs> There is the narrative of anger, the narrative of accusing the other guy of all problems that exist. And lest you think I'm anti-Republican, there is the narrative of those bastards in Wall Street or those billionaires who are taking away our middle class jobs. I'd like to talk to you today about some other narratives, narratives that I was very familiar with and uh, at the suggestion of Lisa Ann, I want to, it's a very personal story. My mother was brought up in Israel. Here she is on a kibbutz. Uh, and grew up in the environment uh, of that very early pre-Israeli stage when it was still British Palestine. She went to the Hebrew University and studied nuclear chemistry. And uh, in a class studying nuclear chemistry, met this man, my dad. <laughs> and they were married. And discovered that in order to move on in their careers, they needed to come to the United States to get their PhDs. So they were accepted at the University of Wisconsin. Here's my mother. You'll note a bump in the front of her tummy. That was me on the boat, on the way over. Here she is arriving in New York. And in 1948, I arrived. <laughs> they graduated in 1950 with uh, PhDs in physics. And I tried to find the statistics on this. I really did. I think my mother was the only woman in the United States to get a PhD in 1950. She worked uh, in, they moved when I was uh, five to, to Berkeley, um, and both of them worked at the university. There were funny anti-nepotism laws, so she worked at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs. My dad got the professorship at the university. Eventually that went away, and she got a professorship as well. And, and um, they did extremely important work, including participation in the Nobel Prize winning experiments that determined that actually antimatter existed in 1955 with the discovery of the antiproton. I grew up with these kinds of folks at our dinner table. That is Oppenheimer, Emilio Segre, uh, Owen Chamberlain, uh, in the upper is Donald, Donald Glazer, below him uh, is E.O. Lawrence, after which the Lawrence Laboratories are named, and in the extreme right, very small, is Edward Teller. 
Uh, for those of you who he is, you may understand why. Um, but these were the people who came to our dinners on Friday nights. My mother was a consummate physicist, and she was a consummate hostess. I would say that never in her life did the issue of discrimination or gender bias enter even into her mind. Now, mind you, she's been gone a long time. I wish I could ask her. But I'm pretty sure that's true. When she spoke to a group of men about her physics experiments, she'd sit on the desk and cross her legs, and everybody was paying very close attention. <laughs> so what did I learn from all this? Well, I guess it never occurred to me that there was such a thing as discrimination against women. It did not occur to me until I actually got into the workforce and began to see it personally. I actually founded a company, and the four men who founded the company were sitting around together, and I noticed that it felt an awful lot like a locker room. In fact, it even smelled a little like a locker room. <laughs> they were programmers, after all. And, <laughs> and I knew something was missing. So the very next thing we did is we hired a female programmer who joined us, and then later on as the company grew, we were about 50-50 men and women. There's one woman who's significantly missing from this, who you all probably know. My first VP of marketing was Cynthia Ringo, now at, at DBL. When I became a venture capitalist, I have just looked back of the last eight companies that we've invested in, they have, uh, there has been a woman either a founder or CEO. I'll tell you who these are, but I'm running out of time. Lindsay will be here this afternoon to talk to you. She just became president of Building Robotics, I'm very happy to say. And this remarkable woman, who was here at, at Google for a long time, uh, had a big battle with cancer, and then single-handedly sailed that boat after a bicycle accident from San Francisco to Kauai. You know all this stuff, I'm sure. There's reason for optimism. More women are getting BAs than men. If you look at what's going on in the schools, law school is 50%, medical school 48%, MBA is 40%, and 72% of graduating women from high school go on to get to college, whereas only 62% of men do. So we're looking forward to a female-dominated world. <laughs> Who makes the best leaders? Recent Pew Research. This basically says that 84% of all people feel that women are equal or better as leaders. It's a time for really genuine optimism. And if you look at this chart, it's a little, I'm sure it's hard to see, but the green represents companies that went public, that were funded by venture capital funds. The green are the companies that had women in senior management the black are the ones that don't. I heard tell that there are some people who feel that you're not getting funded in your startup because there isn't a man running it. I want to tell you that is a wrong narrative. It's not true. You need to know in your heart and you need to know that chart because VCs love money. And if you show them this, <laughs> It is indisputable that it makes sense to fund a female-run company. So I'd like to just harken back to a narrative from the 70s that I really loved. Paul Simon said it so well. These are the days of miracle and wonder. These are the days of the long-distance call. The way the camera follows us in slow-mo. The way we look to us all. The way we look to a distant constellation dying in a corner of the sky. These are the days of miracle and wonder. Don't cry, baby. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Don't cry. <laughs>